Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Bridging the Gap. My name's Byron Nash, and I have my homie here, Johnny Angel. Good to see you, brother, and uh, I'm excited about today, man. Yeah, today's going to be a good one. Uh, and before we get into that, uh, I had this thing coming across the bridge the other day and thinking about Pittsburgh, you know, mm -hmm. and, and thinking about the contribution Pittsburgh's made to music and where it's at and where it's going, where it's been. And um, you start thinking about all the people, like in my museum, that they'll come in here for the first time and they'll say, Lou Christie's from Pittsburgh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or uh, Tommy Hunt from the Flamingos, he's from the Hill. You know, and it's kind of cool. And um, it, it's, it's a strange thing that people don't relate Pittsburgh as being music. Yeah. They should. <laughs> well, it's interesting. There's so many people that came out of here, you know, that have written big songs, became really big artists, or that are still here doing big things, but for some reason I think because we're focused on sports, yeah, the music kind of takes a back seat for how much it's talent true. we actually have brewing here. So, so true, so yeah. true. So when you got started, was it, because I know we're talking different eras, was it considered like a music thing? Because I know you were talking about being signed and, and, and writing these songs and looking for management and things like yep. that. Were people coming here looking for artists? They, they, Pittsburgh had a lot of small labels mm -hmm. here in, in the Berg, and they had a lot of cool promoters from here. But what they, what they would do is they would first record here like at Gateway or one of those places, mm -hmm. and then they'd send them up to New York because that's where everything came out of at the right. time. That was like the hub. And a lot of them, when they would go up there, people would, th would have thought they were from that, that area, even though they're not, because they're, they're breaking them in New York. You yeah. Know? So that, that kind of thing happened a lot back then. And, um, but just to give you an idea, a lot of the doo-wop groups that I've worked with over the years used to say to me that we knew we had a hit record if it was being written up and being played in Pittsburgh, believe oh. it or not, and because of the Pittsburgh Courier. Oh, okay. Because of the, I mean, that was the voice of the nation, and it came out of Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they knew if they were traveling the country and they were playing, but if it was hit in Pittsburgh and it was written up in the Pittsburgh Courier, they knew that they were going to have a hit record. It's interesting that you say that because I, I was thinking about all of the artists that have come out like later on as well that have done really well. Like I saw Wiz Khalifa just played NASCAR, which is kind of a huge thing, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, but then, you know, people like Mac Miller and all these other artists that have branched out, but also there's a lot of producers like in the hip hop and R&B realm that are crushing that people don't realize have come from here. So, uh, you know, we're not just sports here, guys. We're music too. You it's know? the water. Yeah, <laughs> something in the water. So speaking of uh, this region, there's a record I've been listening to uh -oh. that I already know you know what this is. <laughs> I, you know all about this. Ohio players. Yes. Um, I grew up on, well, one, you know, I grew up on a lot of vinyl and I was always like hypnotized by this. Obviously, a cover like this when I'm like six years old yeah. is pretty hypnotizing. But this is some serious true gritty funk music sure is. that again you listen to it and you you, know, you wouldn't think just ohio i don't know where i think funk would come from but yeah. ohio would <laughs> you be the place about, no, no. and these guys just had it but also just like the presentation of the art too like the big fold outs and the whole um oh yeah you know how everybody had like the same kind of outfit kind of like earth wind and fire and all those bands absolutely the bands of the day but this is sort of my record of the week because uh, cool. I don't, I'm, I'm on a funk kick right now. For sure. <laughs> what have you been well, rocking? I was listening to, uh, I've been switching back and forth of rhythm and blues and blues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came across this album I had in my collection, uh, of course, of the Thunderbirds. Yeah. Right. And, and of course, Kim playing the harp and the whole bit. But, you know, the guitar player, of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm starting to think again about how here's a group that uh, got they were known on the national scene as being something new and hip, and yeah. they were playing mostly old blues with a new twist. What to was it. that song? Tough enough. Tough enough. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and I thank you by Sam and Dave. They mm -hmm. covered that, you know, which was kind of cool. So that's what I was into this week, and uh, just something different. Yeah, awesome. So I want to tell you a little bit about our guest because yes. I've known her a long time, uh, hold her in high regard, have a lot of respect for her, been a fan probably since the '90s, to be honest with you. Guys, we're going to have Liz Berlin. Um, she owns Mr. Small. She used to be in Rusted Root. She does her own thing. It's a whole, whole long list of things that she's done, but she's going to be better telling you about it than me. So stay tuned for Liz Berlin. Jack, Jack in the Box. 
Welcome to Jack in a Box. I'm Jack and I'm in another one of my boxes. I'm talking about the Porky Room, the Pittsburgh Room, right? And I'm going to reminisce just a little bit about some of the cool collectibles from Porky Chedwick, like this cup signed by Porky, right? And some of those albums, how about the Golden Gassers, huh? And we got uh, Porky's Dusty Discs, and we got Porky's Salute to the Young Lovers, and we got the uh, Porky Golden Goodies. And we got the Dusty Discs again. And my favorite with him laying down with all the records. Porky Chadwick. He is the man. He is Ginchy. Oh, Ginchy stuff, baby. Hey, welcome back. We're here on the set with Liz Berlin, and we got a lot to talk about from music to Mr. Smalls to Liz. So uh, let's just chat a little bit. If, if you don't mind, if I can lay the first question out there, how did you get started in music? Oh, how did I get started in music? You know, I, my parents trained me to sing classically from a very young age. Right. Um, they were they were classical singers, and they were when we moved to Pittsburgh, they were in the Mendelssohn Choir. Oh. And at the time, there was no children's choir at all. So they were actually instrumental in the founding of what was called the Children's Festival Chorus. Yes. Um, which what was developed specifically to have a children's choir to sing with Pittsburgh Symphony. Nice. Nice. <laughs> so that was my start in music. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. And you didn't just start at the ground level. You jumped right to the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of church basements before that. But, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you. yeah. We, I got did some pretty awesome stuff as a child. Wow. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, picked up the guitar when I was about 15, 16. When did you get into, like, the band life? Um, well, that was a uh, sort of high school, college. Um, during high school, uh, I was part of a, a group of youth that started a group called Youth Cry, which was like a, a youth political activist organization citywide. Um, and, and I was one of a couple people that would like show up with a guitar. The other person was Michael Glavicki. Oh, okay. Uh, we ended up forming Rusty Roots. So the, he and I would kind of always be playing the benefits together. And, mm -hmm. and we started collaborating during that time. Um, we fell out of touch a little bit, both went to college, and then a year into college, you know, he calls me and he's like, I'm thinking about really doing a band now. <laughs> so that's when we kind of like solidified as a band and yeah. started bringing in other band members. So I remember the scene back then. We had graffiti, we had all these different, the loft and all these cool clubs. And I remember you guys were playing that. As someone who's been in the scene for all the time, what are some of the changes you've noticed, like with the way clubs are, with the way that bands kind of have to book themselves, and the whole kind of dynamic of the yeah. music business as an independent artist? Um, I mean, there's a lot of changes. I mean, in the early days of Rusted Root, you know, there were the major clubs. The graffiti was, of course, where you wanted to play. Mm -hmm. That's, that was the spot. Um, but, you know, we really took it upon ourselves to do things like book out the Birmingham Lofts, which was yeah. this empty spot that you could do whatever you wanted and, and throw concerts there. So I think from the beginning, we had that kind of like DIY, mm -hmm. you know, create a spot and they will come, um, you know, from the beginning. Um, and then as far as like evolution until now, you know, there's a lot of uh, been amazing spots that have They really up. are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my husband and I kind of like got together and our goal and getting together was to um, continue to create like opportunity for people. And like, you know, when we were first dating, we're driving around talking about, you know, we want to we want to create a maybe a skate park, maybe a club, maybe yeah. a recording studio. And, um, you know, it ended up being what you guys know as Mr. Small. Yes. <clears throat> wow. yeah. And it's grown a lot since you first opened. Oh, it's grown so much. Yes. <laughs> so much. Yeah. Mike Speranzo, he's freaking builds everything yeah. it's just like never ending <laughs> always evolving like hogwarts uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> was being a musician very helpful in how to run a venue and some of the components that maybe other venues wouldn't have because they're not looking at it from an artist's perspective were there oh, certain extremely. advantages you guys had i mean extremely i mean I, I i don't know if i would call it advantages because we were just a couple of idiot kids with a little bit of money yeah and you know and and because of that you know we we had to struggle and hand to mouth all this time. Um, but what I would say is that the advan biggest advantage was the perspective is that, 
you know, we traveled around the country, um, especially when our son, our, our son was a baby, we would travel together as a family. Yeah. And, and every place that we would go, we kind of became aware of what was out there and in building our own place we wanted to create everything that we never found anywhere else mm, yeah. you know so we just kind of knew like what's needed to make an artist comfortable nice. what's needed to make um, an environment where music can actually become something like really really special and like really so an environment that would feed the artist to put out performances that are really really special yes now how did you decide on millville what was the, I'm um, just curious, you're not from Millville, right? Yeah, no, I know, you know, <laughs> Pittsburgh is really unique in that there's a lot of these little, um, little neighborhoods mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, when we were searching around for real estate, we, uh, the first place that we found was in Millville, it was on Grant Avenue and that was our first recording studio. Yeah. Played there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we actually kind of pioneered the, the, the live recording, re you know, package to where fans would. Uh, sell tickets yep. to the recording <laughs> session to pay for their to pay for their nice. album. Um, so and then uh, you know that was a five year lease and 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 the roof caved in and <laughs> we're sitting at the diner next door talking about wow well, what should we do now should we rent should we try to buy something wouldn't it be awesome if we had, if we got a church yeah, that'd be yeah. awesome and so at the counter. Uh, this guy comes walking over from the counter. He's the mayor's brother. <laughs> and he's like, you know, the borough's got a church. Wow. And like that same afternoon, wow. Mike and I are like walking through the St. Anne's Church compound with the, the Millville mayor and the whole entire city council. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like with our jaws on the ground. And, and, you know, it was just kind of like something I think that could only happen in Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah that's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, wow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm having flashbacks. Of, uh, when you brought up the recording, I realized that Mike recorded my first demo at that space. I'm like, okay, yeah. I have all these questions to ask. So, <laughs> so we should bring him up. Yeah, yeah, you know. So with the whole Rust Root thing, after that kind of did what it did, what was your musical goal for yourself? Um, within Rusted Root, and my goal for myself is an interesting journey because in Rusted Root, I was primarily a, a backup singer and a percussionist. Okay. I was sort of relegated to, you know, what, what I was relegated to. Yeah. Um, my own personal creative journey, um, you know, there was a lot of struggle with it. And it's hard to be a side person, mm -hmm. and especially when you're in something that really works. Yeah. You kind of have to stay in your role. And, uh, you know, I tried really hard to evolve musically and, and expand in, and, you know, it was not extremely welcomed within the structure of Rusted Root. So um, as far as my own musical evolution, evolution um, it wasn't really until after my son was, was born and I kind of got to this point where I was like, you know, if, if I'm ever going to do anything other than this, <coughs> I better like effing do it like yeah, yeah. I have to do it I have to just make it happen yeah. and so that was really kind of my motivation to like really focus on my songs um, at that time uh, we had our recording studio at the first location yes and I just like had to really make a point to just get myself in there mm -hmm. and start tracking and Mike helped me a lot you know getting getting stuff tracked and and I spent a lot of hours in there just kind of crafting that first solo album Nice. I'm really glad that I did because I, as a as a, a woman as a mother, there's a lot of struggles there to get to the point where, as a woman, you can figure out what you want to do and how to do it. There's not a lot of guidance, yeah. and I, yeah. I, I know myself as a woman, I did, or as a female, I wasn't really trained to like ask for what I needed or to mm. or to know how to seek out yep. the assistance that would get me to where I wanted to go. So right. it was all it was a really intense learning process interesting interesting yeah. um what's next what's <coughs> next yeah. what is next well um gee <laughs> put me on the spot <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> we improv all this so it's like yeah. <laughs> we're always on the spot yeah no i mean i would like to do some more music um right now i'm sort of like um super overwhelmed with what i have, what I have going on yeah. with um with smalls i'm also um, 
running a program called the We Rock Workshop mm -hmm. that um, I don't think I have ever told you about this. Um, <coughs> we Rock Workshop is a, a program that um, we've developed over the last 12 years where we take uh, current and former foster kids, 14 to 24, we take them into the Mr. Small's recording studio on the north side, go nice. through eight weeks of pre-production, songwriting, mm -hmm. recording, and then we do eight weeks of rehearsals, and then we do a final show at Mr. Small's Theater. Oh, that's nice. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, we've been doing that for 12 years, and during the pandemic, we had to take it all virtual. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> so I was having weekly Zoom classes, and I started teaching an online recording studio and giving them all access from their personal devices to oh, be wow. able to actually do pre-production and recording. Um, and it turned out that during the pandemic, uh, it turned out that they let me, well, DHS let me know that I was like the only person actually reaching kids with any sort of programming oh. at all during the pandemic. Wow. And um, because of that, they invited me to um, submit an expand, a proposal a proposal for expansion, Good which they nice. accepted. So, That's great. which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So That's now I'm doing good. it year round That's and it's beautiful. a lot. And yeah, so that's, I guess if you ask me what's next, that's like the biggest thing on my horizon. Oh, that's um, big. Yeah, that's it was big. pretty Congrats. big, yeah. I've got to get up there now. It's uh, It's been years since I was over your place. Yeah. And, uh, I think that you have a new room now and you have, uh, that wasn't there before, you know, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah, we have the whole <laughs> new club, the Fun House. Yes. Um, the 200 capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So, now we do this thing, if it's okay with you, we do this thing called Rapid Fire. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we throw uh, something old, something new, something treasured, something true. Okay. And, uh, we don't want to give you a lot of time to think about it, because that's why it's called rapid fire. So okay. let's ask you this. Something old. Oh, jeez. Uh, my monkey's record. Ah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> something new. Something new. Oh. Oh, I'm blanking. I'm blanking. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I guess it'll be the proposal. Yeah. The, the well, I guess the new, have, right? the new program. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. pretty new. Uh-huh. Yeah. And something treasured. Something treasured. My husband. Oh, oh. I love it. <laughs> um, something true. Something that your fans wouldn't know about you. That... Something true. I can wiggle my ears. <laughs> <laughs> and you sang in the child's choir. So yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. I sang with the Pittsburgh Opera. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. So we're going to come back and uh, do a little jam, one of your songs. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Yeah. Stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to Byron's Bodega. So today, I want to share with you, well one, Herbie Hancock's one of my favorite jazz artists of all time. And I scored this awesome box set. Again, I'm a nerd for packaging. And when I saw this cube, I've never seen anything still to this day that was like that. So it has all the CDs in there, but you open this cube and you slide it out to get them. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. Um, and here you get your booklet and all the CDs sit there right in the rack and then you slide it back in. Not as easy to put back together as to take it apart. That said, I really think this is one of the coolest things I've ever added to my music collection. And so if you ever see anything like this, get it because this is some A plus packaging. Wow. 
what it is, ain't it exactly?